And now an update on where things stand with the state budget and Governor Cuomo. You might remember the book he published last year. Well, new reporting this week suggests he may have used state resources to write it and promote it, and that could be illegal. So let's dig into that and more with this week's panel. Karen DeWitt is from New York State Public Radio. Hey. John Campbell is from the USA Today Network. Thank you both for being here. Sure thing. So let's talk about the budget first. Oh, okay. Let's get that out of the way because right. we are taping at uh, around 9 a.m. on mm -hmm. Friday. As of now, we do not have a budget deal. We don't know what's going on. There has been no updates. Uh, the legislative leaders, as we alluded to at the beginning of the show, have not spoken to us this entire week. And this is the budget week where the budget is officially late. Karen, what's going on? <laughs> I have no idea, but it does feel very reminiscent of going back ten, more than a decade ago when David Patterson was governor and before that George Pataki, when the budget would often be late. And you know, this time of the year, April 2nd or 3rd, you wouldn't know when it was gonna be passed. And in those cases, sometimes it was weeks, even months before they came to agreement. I don't think that's gonna happen now, but it does feel like it's falling apart in a way that it hasn't in 10 years. Now, granted, I'm saying this Friday morning, maybe they'll have an agreement Friday afternoon, but it does seem like Governor Cuomo's iron grip on the budget for 10 years, where at least at this point, if it wasn't passed, you knew like when it was gonna be passed that they had agreements on things, that is not happening. It does seem like there's a real absence here. And uh, you know, you gotta wonder, does it have something to do with the fact that the governor is now facing four pretty major scandals and that he's politically weakened? That's a really good point. John, do we know why the budget is late? It, it came as a little bit of a surprise to me because the one house budgets were pretty aligned and the governor's power seemed to be pretty diminished. So I guess I expected to have an on-time budget. Do we know why? You know, the governor's power is pretty diminished, but the way the state of New York works, the governor has a lot of power still, you know? I mean, he can line item veto any number of things in the budget. And and so that is still a threat uh, that is that is difficult to overcome. Now, both in the Senate and the Assembly, they have Democratic supermajorities where they could overturn that, but, you know, to make the decision to, to go it alone without the governor is a big, big break from precedent. And that's something that, uh, you know, at some point the legislature might have to, to have to decide. But we do know some of the things that are still being debated, taxes on the wealthy and on Wall Street. And we also know there's a big debate now going on about the Penn Station development and the area around Penn Station. This is like uh, a never-ending conversation. Yeah, Penn absolutely. Station has been like my whole life and a half. And yeah. me too, and I'm way older <laughs> than you. I like, I, I, I want to live to see a nice Penn Station, right? You know. <laughs> Sorry, John. Go ahead. Well, it, it's just we we know some of the things, but you know because we don't have these behind closed door negotiating sessions that the three of us and any number of our colleagues stake out for hours just to get a little blurb about the budget, we know less than we normally do because all these, this negotiation is happening on Zoom now. And I would argue that we did put pressure on the lawmakers in the past because they would have to come out and face the gauntlet of reporters and say something, right. at least, well, we have a tentative agreement or feel like, oh, we don't want to do this another day and face those reporters. You know, let's try to get something done. So I think that that did help. Now it's kind of... I mean, face it, we've had the pandemic for over a year. Nobody knows what day it is anyway. So what does April 1st matter? There's a little bit of that going on. The, one, one big thing, one big source of pressure that they're going to have to face is the state employees. If there's not some sort of budget in place by Monday, even if it's a temporary emergency spending plan, uh, 39,000 state employees will, will see their paychecks delayed. And that is not a constituency, constituency that you want to make mad. But I have seen them turn it around faster. I remember yeah. in the past the controller saying, well, it's got to be done by Monday, and somehow they can do it in a day. They don't <laughs> like to, yeah. but you know. But definitely that is kind of a hard deadline early next week. It depends on how much they want to talk on the floor when the bills actually come up, and who wants to get that, that video that they can put out on Twitter oh, of them debating the, <laughs> the bill on the floor. Let's move on from the budget since we don't really know too much about it, unfortunately. Mm. Um, I, I said at the top of the segment about Cuomo's book deal. We have some new details about it and some new controversies about it. Karen, can you lay it out a little bit? What's going on here? Um, yeah, well, I was actually going to refer to John yeah, because John he, he like Absolutely. did such a great no, that, article of yeah. laying out exactly what might have been done. In our so case. Wednesday night, uh, we the, the governor's office released, uh, after months of, of reporters asking for it, released the permission he got from the Joint Commission on Public Ethics deputy counsel 
uh, to write his book on the, the, the COVID pandemic, American Crisis, which came out last year, sold more than 40,000 copies, landed on the bestseller list. Uh, and they released that, and about an hour and a half later, the New York Times had a story that said Cuomo fielded offers north of $4 million for that mm. book in the middle of the pandemic at a time where his, his global star was higher than it's ever been. Uh, but then, you know, if you looked at the approval from the, the Joint Commission on Public Ethics Attorney, uh, there were a lot of criteria that he had to follow. He had to follow nine criteria. Essentially, he couldn't use state resources to promote the book or write the book. He couldn't advertise it or endorse it at any public events, et cetera. Um, you know, he couldn't use state personnel. And we know now that he did a lot of those things. Now, the governor's office is, it, there's three senior members of, of his uh, staff, at least, that worked on the book in some form or fashion. Rich Azaparty, Stephanie Benton, and Melissa DeRosa. The governor's office claims they all volunteered their time, but that's a very thin line to walk, and at the very least, they're towing the line of what they were allowed to do. And it sounds like they did spend quite a lot of time. It wasn't just an hour here, an hour there, you know, help me figure out this sentence. Like, Melissa DeRosa apparently was very involved in the editing of it. But that said, his, his staff, they don't punch a time clock. So I think it'd be hard to prove that they weren't volunteering because right. they work so much as it is. I'm sure they work well over 40 yeah, hours it's, a it's, week. So. There's a weird, a weird kind of time card situation where if they, they have to take time off if they work less than seven and a half hours in a day. Uh, but they all work more yes, than seven and a half exactly. hours in a day. So there's also junior staffers that were asked to take notes, uh, to type up notes, to print out copies and, and deliver it to the governor's mansion. And that seems to be a pretty clear violation of using state resources for, for book purposes. The governor's office claims it was, quote, incidental. The other question okay. is who's going to investigate this? Yeah. The Joint Commission on um, Public Ethics has a very poor track record. It's pretty much controlled by Cuomo. Um, if it is a violation of the public officer's law, which it does seem to be a violation of, are they going to be able to authorize an investigation and carry it out? That's a big that's a big yeah. question and, right and, now. And, you know, if they were to carry it out, they could levy a fine of up to $10,000 if they found there was a violation of the public officer's law. And they could go after the value of the benefit he derived from that. What? And if the value is, you know, if he has <laughs> yes. a $4 million book contract, that's a very big value. Wait, they could claw back $4 million? Well, they? they could claw back whatever amount they decide that he derived specifically from that benefit. Ah, okay. So, depends on how aggressive they would want to be. And that, again, is if they were to find there was a violation of the public officers. Yeah, and we should also mention the assembly impeachment inquiry is also going to look at this yeah. book deal. And it's just kind mm -hmm. of piling up one more thing of what's been relentless two months now that the governor has faced bad news nearly every other day. It's really been quite an onslaught and quite extraordinary that really he is still there. It's been a bad month. But we have to leave it there. Karen DeWitt from New York State Public Radio, John Campbell from USA Today Network. Thank you both for being here.